Thank you. I want to welcome everyone to the Horseshoe Crab uh, Management Board meeting. If you are on another flight, please get on the correct plane. My name's Malcolm Rhodes. I'm taking over for Jim Gilmore and wanted to welcome uh, y'all here. We had sent out materials previously. Uh, we had an agenda and I was wondering if there were any additions or corrections to it. Seeing none, we'll move for approval by consent. We also received the proceedings from last October's uh, meeting. Uh, were there any corrections or changes to those? Seeing none, we'll approve those by consent. Um, this is a time for public comment for any issues not uh, on the agenda. Is there anyone uh, from the public who would wishes to uh, speak to the board? Great, seeing none, we will move down to item number four. Uh, Rachel uh, is going to review the results of the eel and whelk bait practices survey. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll be presenting the Horse Crab Technical Committee's report on bait use surveys of the American eel and the channeled whelk fisheries. So we had two main goals with this survey. Uh, one was to discover how horseshoe crabs are used as bait in the trap pot gear for both the American eel and the channeled whelk fisheries. And we wanted to look at things like preference, prevalence, and how, you know, how the bait performed. The second goal was to provide information for the future viability of manufactured or artificial baits. And we wanted to know things like the amount of horseshoe crab that was used, average cost per trap, and the industry's impression of manufactured baits. So for our methods, between January and February of 2017, surveys were mailed to all current permit holders in the eel and channeled whelk fisheries. The only exceptions to that were New York only mailed the survey to fishers that were active in the previous two years, and South Carolina does not currently permit the use of horseshoe crabs as bait. Um, however, they do have a small-scale whelk fishery, and a description of that fishery and its bait practices was included in Appendix 3 of the bait survey report. So for the survey responses, um, from on this graph you could see the state on the left-hand side, and in blue are how many surveys were sent, and orange are the number of responses that were received. So overall, for the American eel surveys that were sent out, uh, the return rate was 30 percent. Uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut do not currently have active American eel fisheries. For the responses for the channeled whelk fisheries, um, again, in blue are the surveys sent, and the orange are the number of responses that were received back. The return rate for the voluntary surveys was 32 percent overall. Um, for Massachusetts, the survey was a requirement for permit renewal, so that's why they had such a, a high return rate. Uh, as you can see also from this chart, Georgia and Florida do not currently have channeled whelk fisheries. So one of the first things that we asked was how experienced the responders were. Um, as you can see, the largest slice of this pie is over 20 years of experience, 33 percent had more than that, and over 50 percent had at least 11 years of experience. Uh, so overall, the respondents were experienced in their fishery. So the results for uh, bait preference, the next couple of slides, I'm going to try to use the same, uh, use the same color scheme. Um, you'll notice that the channeled whelk fishery responses on the circle chart are in purple, and the American eel fishery are in green. So overall, the channeled whelk fishery is using more horseshoe crabs as bait than the American eel fishery. 92% of channeled whelk fishers reported using horseshoe crabs as bait versus only 23% of American eel fishers. 
Now to expand on that, in both fisheries, most fishers were reporting using multiple primary baits in their pots. Only 8% of channel whelk fishers reported only using horseshoe crabs versus 1% of American eel fishers only using horseshoe crabs. For a brief summary of the other primary baits that they were using, these were the four main primary baits. Um, they included fish as racks or whole, shellfish, blue crabs, and green crabs. And this was for both fisheries. So to continue on how they were using horseshoe crabs, the American eel fishery uses more female crabs than male crabs. 66% uh, of American eel fishers reported using female crabs versus 49% of channel whelk fishers. Um, in addition to that, most fishers are not using whole crabs. So both fisheries use a larger proportion of male crabs than female crabs, and this could be related to the fact that male crabs are smaller than female crabs. If you look at this circle chart, I know it's a little bit busy, but the darker green is for the American eel fishery is less than a quarter female, and the lighter section is uh, greater than a half of a male. Uh, and the same color scheme for the channel's whelk fishery. So we also asked them about bait saving devices, uh, like bait bags. They were more common among channeled whelk fishers than American eel fishers. 92% of channeled whelk fishers reported some type of bait saver use versus only 21% of American eel fishers. And most states, with the exception of Delaware, do not currently require the use of bait saving devices in these fisheries. We also asked questions on the type of gear they were fishing. Coastwide, the channeled whelk fishery has more fishing gear to bait on average. There was an average reported maximum of 212 pots in the water for channeled whelk fishers versus 165 pots for American eel fishers. Channeled whelk fishers were also fishing more pots per trip on uh, average, they had 147 pots versus only 80 pots for the American eel fishers. So there were regional differences in gear composition. Uh, for the channeled whelk fishery, Massachusetts through New York fish less pots on average than New Jersey through Virginia. Um, and for the American eel fishery, Maryland had several fishers that reported extremely high maximum pots in the water and pots used per trip, which kind of skewed uh, some of those numbers. For how bait is needed seasonally, the coastwide channeled whelk fishery has two peaks and a defined season that begins in April and ends after December. Uh, peak fishing activity, as you can see from this chart, uh, occurs between May through July and September through December. And this is just a number of responses. For the American eel fishing uh, activity, the coastwide fishery also has two peaks, but it occurs more continuously through the year. So peak fishing activity occurs between March through June and September through November. Um, we asked about uh, each fishery's manufactured bait usage. So both fisheries had low percentage of uh, participants who had tried manufactured or artificial baits. For the fishers that tried the baits, most of them reported poor results. Um, as you can see on this uh, pie chart, the orange are the people who have never used it, and that big chunk of blue are the people that said yes, they used it, but had poor results. And if you could see the tiny little sliver of red, those are the people that used it and thought it worked. 
So uh, based on technical committee discussions of the previous manufactured bait trials that we had, um, poor results might not have been solely based on bad performance. Um, Fishers reported issues of cost and issues of availability that also affected um, their view of manufactured bait. So for information that's important for any viability of a future manufactured bait, both fisheries and all current bait practices, uh, the bait typically lasts for two days. And on average, it's costing $1.50 or less per pot. Um, overall, the price per pot was generally more expensive in the whelk fishery than in the eel fishery. So based on these results that we received, uh, manufactured bait, um, in order to be viable, would need to last at least two days, and it would need to cost $1.50 or less to have a chance of success. Um, it would also need to use either less than an eighth of a female horseshoe crab or less than a quarter of a male horseshoe crab to use less crabs per trap than the current bait practices. Questions? Okay. All right, well, first of all, I want to thank the technical committee for um, doing the time to, or making the survey and getting all the results together. This was something that the um, board asked the technical committee to do at the annual meeting last year. So this is helpful to all of us to understand kind of where we are with the baits, what they're used for, and uh, where we're going. Uh, I saw hands up over here, Emerson and Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, hi, Rachel. Thank you for that uh, presentation. It was very good. And thank you for doing that survey. It's very interesting. Um, the one question I had was um, on one of your slides, you showed that shellfish was a large component um, of, of an alternative bait. Um, so what was included in that category, shellfish? Was it basically bivalve mollusks, mollusks or was it something else? What was, what was grouped in there? Um, so we included complete breakdowns in the uh, supplemental materials we sent out, but it was a mix and it was very dependent on which state you were in. So there, it was largely bivalve mollusks, but there were, uh, I believe, some shrimp and other things included in that category as well. And we, we break down the full list in the report. Tom? Rachel, we've done this kind of study before over the years. I think it's been three or four times we've done this study. Did you go back and look at the comparison of what the results were on this work and compared to the other two studies? I think two or three, I'm not sure exactly the number, to see if we start getting more participation or less as far as using the artificial bait? Um, so I wasn't involved in any of the previous studies, and I wasn't aware that we looked at how bait was used. Are you talking specifically about the artificial bait studies that were previously done? Yeah. Um, so we didn't look, uh, we didn't do a cross comparison. Um, the technical committee felt that we should at least get a baseline of what current fishery practices were doing and just an overall view of the manufactured bait that had been used. Um, so certainly not everybody who participated in those previous bait trials might have responded on this report. It was, uh, responses were anonymous, so we weren't able to kind of go back and see if everyone um, who participated in the other trials participated in this. So we only got a O broad overview of just their impression of manufactured bait. Yep. I want to follow up to that. When I was looking at the participation from surveys, and since part of my background was marketing advertising, I really realized that Massachusetts skewed the numbers on one of those in comparison to New Jersey, who basically had a lot of things going out, a lot of uh, questionnaires going on, and very small response. So if you looked at individual states, New Jersey's response was probably less than 3% or 4% or 5% of what was going on. And how did you weight those? 
because you're looking at it in one way. Massachusetts kind of skewed the numbers for all the other states because it was mandatory. Right. So for our analysis of the results, we did break it down by state. So we did a lot of side-by-side -side analysis of how each state's results came out. Um, in this particular presentation that I did, uh, we took the overall results because for the most part, even though, yes, there were a larger number of responses from Massachusetts and a larger number of participants uh, in Massachusetts, but overall their results were very similar. The biggest differences that we saw was in the amount of gear that they used. So they did use, um, uh, they had larger, particip uh, larger participation, but a smaller amount of gear that they reported on average and a smaller amount of gear um, per trip. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Rachel, for the survey report. Um, what's discouraging for me and perhaps other members of the board are, are the poor results for artificial baits. Our state spent a fair amount of money a number of years ago funding University of Delaware studies on artificial baits, and we all had high hopes um, for artificial baits. And um, to see their I think it was less than 1% or something. That was a very low percentage reported use. Are there any, did you receive any feedback on what the principal complaints were and how that situation could be rectified or um, is there a light at the end of the tunnel with regard to artificial baits? Thank you. So, we had um, a lot of detailed discussions before we sent this survey out, and we were discussing a lot of the complaints that we had received about artificial baits, and that was why we tried to put this together in a, um, in a way that we got at what the average cost was, how long it was used for, and how much horseshoe crab was in it, because the artificial bait trials, um, I believe, that were used in the past used, based on these survey results about the same amount of horseshoe crab that the fishery was already using on its own. Um, in addition to that, I know that there were reports of longevity issues because I guess the, um, the type of manufactured bait that was sort of a uh, puck dissolved fairly quickly and didn't get you that two days, um, two day uh, soak time. So those were complaints, and also the, another complaint was that the cost was about the same or more than what was already available. Um, and that was, once again, why we sent this out, to just try to get an, a bigger picture of what would a manufactured bait need to actually be successful. Could I follow up just a second? Sure. And the reason that's discouraging is I remember the trials and um, there was much better bait integrity earlier on in the process when it was still in the experimental research phase. So something happened between the experimental research phase and the production phase um, that decreased the integrity of that bait. So I find that discouraging. That's all, Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the report. I just want to uh, make a correction um, about the state's requirements. So in Virginia, uh, the timing might be off here, but I remember Bob Fisher from VIMS did a study. Um, I want to say that by 2006, uh, bait bags were required in Virginia where only a half of a female horseshoe crab could be used, um, whole male crab. And uh, so I just wanted to make that correction. The other situation is in that graphic where you look at the bait and, you know, fish and shellfish and, you know, everything is sort of included. It probably isn't weighed or weighted by regional differences. So, for example, um, not only are there regional differences, but also there are magnitude uh, of differences in terms of the harvest. So it may be good in a further follow-up to something like that to look at the regional specific uses of bait 
relative to the expected amounts of bait because of the um, harvest amount. So I just wanted to add that, so thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, also that um, we did break down everything by, by region, um, by state, uh, in the actual bait survey report if you wanted to look at the, the, the differences. Right. Any other questions? All right. Um, Bob? Probably have the wrong name tag, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Rachel. Does the, um, I realize we call it artificial bait or manufactured bait, same concept. So does the manufactured bait remain available or did this survey hark back to the trial period, which I believe was a couple of years ago? Um, I have a follow-up, but I'm just wondering if, as you, do you know whether the artificial bait remains available to the industry this year, today, as an alternative to, um, to using actual horseshoe crabs? Uh, this is based mostly on the technical committee discussions, but to our knowledge, it isn't in a wide available or large use at all um, in the past couple of years. So past the trials, it doesn't seem that any of them um, were successful. So my follow, and thank you for that, and I share much of what Roy Miller indicated, and that is I, I just feel that it's, it's tough to do an analysis like this when you don't have a readily available alternative. Um, and given Roy's comments about how there seemed to be a transition in, in integrity, that strikes me that the industry is obviously going with what's most available, um, and then of course price and efficacy all fold in. So where do we go from here? I mean, I think that's going to be a key part of the discussion either about to happen or currently happening. Um, and it strikes me that we've either got to just rely on market forces, um, which may well be influenced by an assessment, which may well reduce the availability of, of horseshoe crabs, and then lo and behold, the, uh, you know, the market responds. Um, or we try to nudge that issue um, by trying to work again through a, tr a bait trial um, process to try to see if we can address the very issues that you raise and, and excellent analysis in terms of cost. I mean, clearly this is not gonna work unless it is <laughs> cost effective and the efficacy is there and the convenience is there. And I, I remembered thinking about, you know, the. the the difference between just having a cooler full of hockey pucks versus having your your uh, you know the uh, back of your boat full full of with the crabs. So it seems to me like we still have a door to knock on here, but I'm just not sure how best to to proceed. This survey is is great, but it it doesn't really it's not compelling in terms of what it tells us. It seems to me that we've got to figure out how best to move forward, and either that's going to happen through the pressure of a stock assessment and potentially some limitations on the availability of crab, or we're gonna have to work to try to figure out how to make a product or encourage the availability of a product that, um, that is appealing to the industry, which then uh, allows for a natural transition. Thank you. So, Colleen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to speak to Roy's concerns too with with um, some of the observations that I had during those initial artificial bait trials, specifically one of them being the, the economics of the cost per bait. Um, in our experience that we had in Connecticut, it required two times the amount of bait that the manufacturers thought would be necessary to, um, you know, to result in, in, um, in catches that would be worthwhile. Uh, consistency was a problem in warm water, in uh, warm weather, and in areas with high flow. So the um, the bait seemed to disappear almost overnight. And one of the other big issues with it was because it requires refrigeration and not freezing. The availability of shoreside walk-in refrigerators was a problem in our area. I'm not sure if other states have that that issue, um, but freezing the artificial bait. Um, at least the bait that we had with the manufacturer that made it, it, um, it essentially just freeze dried the product and that affected its performance as well. Thank you. All right, one more. Pat? There's a um, company in North Carolina, I think it's called um, Kepley Biosystems, that's got a Sea Grant, North Carolina Sea Grant 
money to look at what they're calling Organobate. Um, they also have a large National Science Foundation grant to develop these baits in a like a cube so it doesn't need refrigeration. Um, they're starting to look at, they've been looking at lobsters and blue crabs, but they also want to look at these fisheries as well, trying to eliminate horseshoe crabs. Has anybody heard of this company at all? I'm hearing, seeing shaking heads. Um, they've contacted us because of work they're doing, but there's a company that's out there trying to develop these, and they have a very large National Science Foundation grant to do this, and the idea of these, this grant is to be able to create a business that can do this on a regular basis and have it be cost effective. So I don't, I, and they're just in the infancy of this project, so I don't know how successful they're going to be, but we should all be aware that there's other companies out there trying to do this. Thanks for the information, Stuart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rachel, that was an excellent and very thorough uh, review of, uh, of the fishery and their needs. Uh, just, to, just to clarify, so currently the fishery is operating with the same amount of horseshoe crab. They're basically using the same amount of horseshoe crab now that was contained in that alternative bait. Yes, and some of that was uh, because of the reasons that Colleen stated, which two times the amount that they thought would be necessary ended up being necessary, and consistency issues, so if it broke down, they needed more. Um, so that was what ultimately made it the same amount that people are already, already using. And those are just for the baits that also included horseshoe crab in that mixture. Great. Thank you. Great presentation. Wonderful um, talk from the board. Lots of points brought up, historic, and kind of looking towards where going in the future. Um, any more discussion on this topic? All right. Seeing none, we'll move uh, to the fifth topic, which is um, preparing for the 2018 benchmark stock assessment. And I'm turning it over to Kristen. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this morning, I want to go over our plans for a benchmark stock assessment for next year and then uh, present the terms of reference for your consideration. So this is just a reminder of the previous stock assessments that have been done for horseshoe crab. Uh, in 2009 was our last benchmark, and at that time, there was no formal set of reference points. And I've included a table from the stock assessment overview of kind of the status of the horseshoe crab population in each of the regions. Uh, so New England and New York both showed declining population, and Delaware Bay in the southeast were having increasing populations at that time. There was an update done in 2013, and the results were consistent with the benchmark for the most part. And during both of these times, it was stated that biomedicals should be considered to be included in the models for horseshoe crab. Um, it was not included in that benchmark or that update. The reason that biomedical increasingly should be included as part of the coastwide and regional trends is because proportionally it's making up more of the overall harvest. So you have your bait harvest in green, and then the lighter blue is the biomedical harvest. It's thought that 15%, we attribute uh, the 15% mortality to their harvest. So 85% we believe survive, and that's the light blue, the combined, um, all of the biomedical harvest. And then the small dark blue is the mortality that we're attributing to them. But as bait harvest has come down, proportionally speaking, biomedical is making up more of this kind of coast-wide numbers. This is where we are with biomedical facilities. Uh, I believe the 2009 uh, benchmark had, there were four facilities at that time. We now have six along the coast. We still have some data confidentiality issues because while there are four in the Delaware Bay, which exceeds the rule of three, regionally we would still be getting into some uh, confidentiality issues. So for example, if we did publish Delaware Bay numbers, uh, Massachusetts could subtract what they harvest and then identify what South Carolina harvests. So we will still have uh, some data confidentiality issues even though we have more facilities at this time. 
this is the table that's included in the FMP review every year of uh, the number of horseshoe crabs harvested, bled, and the 15% mortality applied to those. Uh, that's in the bottom in the, I guess it's orange. Um, the FMP establishes a mortality threshold of 57,500 horseshoe crabs, uh, which has been exceeded from 2007 to 2015. You can see for the first time uh, that in 2016 it was not exceeded, and this was due to temporary changes in productivity. Um, so, so we're moving into the 2018 assessment uh, with these concerns over New England and New York continuing to show declining trends uh, and the continued need to include biomedical in a regional assessment. And so that's what we've been tasked with moving forward. How we will present this, still sort of remains to be seen. We're doing our data workshop January, February of next year. And once the, uh, the SAS kind of looks at the data, looks at the potential models, uh, sees the biomedical, we, we hope to have a better idea of how we'll move forward with this black box assessment. So what I'd like to do now is go through the terms of reference. Uh, I've abbreviated them, so if you want to see the full terms of reference, they're on page 58 of your meeting materials. But I've sort of summarized them, and I'll just kind of talk about what's different from our standard uh, TORs that are in our TC guidance document. These have been amended to kind of address this regional task as well as the biomedical inclusion. So. Since we're tasked with doing a regional assessment, uh, the first TOR will be to define and justify the use of population structure. Um, we're likely to also look at this population on a coast-wide level, but if we are going to do it regionally, we need to thoroughly examine how that should look. The TOR2 is uh, pretty standard characterized precision and accuracy of fishery independent and fishery dependent data, including biomedical data. TOR3 will be to develop the models, and there are some subpoints under that, but I've put up the, the H bullet because it is uh, specific to horseshoe crab, which will be incorporate biomedical into the models used and reassess the associated mortality of blood crabs on a coastwide and a regional level. So as you know, right now we do the 15% mortality, and this is a benchmark, so this is an opportunity to go back to the literature, to look at different data sets, and really consider is 15 percent the best for the coastwide? Uh, should we be doing this regionally? Is what's happening in one region different from what's happening in other, and should they have different mortality associated with it? So we'll go back to the drawing board for that, and so that's an explicit task for our TORs. Four and five are to characterize the uncertainty in the model and to uh, perform retrospective analysis. TOR six is to recommend a stock status and reference points. And then seven are other potential scientific issues, and one that has been added as a sub-bullet here is to compare any model output for the Delaware Bay region with the output from the ARM model. So we currently use the ARM model to set the harvest specifications in the Delaware Bay, so if the stock assessment is showing a different picture than the ARM model is, or the same, we need to discuss that in the stock assessment. And then TORs 8 through 10 is the minority report, if there is one, to make research recommendations and uh, also recommend a timing of the next assessment going forward. Um, and then we have kind of the mirror of them in the peer review, and those are also pretty standard TORs. Now I think we'll do the AP report, and then I'll... So the advisory panel uh, met in September via conference call, um, and they have uh, some recommendations that they would like to make in reference to uh, the, the stock assessment process. Um, one thing that I just wanted to hit on before we move to that is uh, related to the confidentiality practices within, uh, within this assessment. Um, we've discussed with the SAS, the, uh, the Stock Assessment Subcommittee has applied and is in the process of gaining confidential access to data, so they uh, will have uh, legal permission to view those data. Um, when we get into the actual data workshop, we're going to be having closed-door sessions where, um, where 
basically members that are not that do not have confidential access tc members data providers that do not have that access will be asked to leave the room and the only people in the room will be those that have confidential access and there will be a similar type of closed door process for the review as well so uh, there are going to be some intricacies but we're making our efforts to uh, make sure that we're within the bounds uh, that we're legally bound to for confidentiality purposes and um, now I'm going to turn it over to Jim Cooper to present the AP's recommendations um, for the stock assessment process thank you very much Mike and by the way we we uh, Advisory panel appreciates your work and that of the staff in helping us uh, uh, put this uh, together. Um, there is one uh, correction for you. There was a slide earlier about uh, the number of biomedical uh, companies, and there's an error on that uh, slide. Uh, there is no biomedical company called HEPTEST uh, uh, in Virginia. That's, uh, that's an inaccuracy. Uh, you, you can reference the FDA. The FDA decides who is a uh, uh, biomedical uh, producer. They may be using horseshoe crabs for some type of scientific uh, process, but uh, they're certainly not part of the biomedical. We've alerted the staff to this, and we hope that this can be uh, corrected uh, in, in the future. Uh, going on to uh, of the slide, uh, our group of course, is, um, is eager to see the 15% mortality uh, reevaluated, and hopefully there will be, uh, they'll look at all types of information to try to arrive at a good uh, opinion on that matter. You know, the 15% mortality has been sort of held uh, in great reverence uh, since it was uh, initially uh, suggested from a study uh, in Charleston. Uh, associated with a graduate student there who uh, observed that after a, a week that uh, three of 15 uh, crabs, uh, or three of 20 crabs uh, did not uh, survive for the full week, and that's where the original 15% uh, percent came from. So uh, we would suspect that this was most likely the highest uh, uh, possible or most the highest mortality that one would expect from this kind. Our um, industry has found that it's probably close to 10 percent, that is a 90 percent uh, survival. And I understand that someone will be uh, coming, commenting on this a little bit later in the, uh, uh, in the, in the day, in this session. But uh, uh, nevertheless, we can, we can go on to that. So the, uh, the AP certainly recommended that not only would they look at uh, horseshoe crab peer-reviewed uh, papers re with regard to uh, mortality assessment and, and that uh, uh, type of thing, but look at other information as well. A couple of the peer-reviewed papers uh, that are out there we, we think suffer from the uh, methodology uh, issues, but I, I think the SAS can uh, look into that appropriately. So we would also uh, hope that uh, marine resource studies that have been done by some of the states, and some of them are really elegant studies, uh, this is difficult work, work to do, and we would hope that that would be looked at as well. And look at the historical data that the biomedical facilities uh, have um, uh, come up with over uh, the years. No one is more uh, dedicated and more um, uh, st striving more to s guarantee the sustainability of the horseshoe crab than, than our industry. We have an enormous responsibility of uh, protecting the world's uh, uh, injectable medication supply, so uh, we are indeed uh, interested in good management decisions from this, and we work hard to make sure that we uh, guarantee their sustainability. Now, we would hope that uh, you would include a, a biomedical scientist in, in, uh, in this SAS uh, process, and their, their role would not be in looking at the modeling, but making sure that the methodology of some of these studies uh, is evaluated properly so that the numbers they get help them understand whether or not this represents what's going on in the biomedical uh, community. 
And um, we'd also uh, recommend that these, uh, uh, the findings of the SAA uh, would, uh, would be reviewed in some way or form or fashion uh, with appropriate confidentiality, uh, be reviewed before uh, any uh, final uh, submission. And I want to assure you that what we want here is, is uh, meaningful dialogue to be taking place with the biomedical community as well as others because we want good outcomes. Uh, I've heard uh, the rumor that uh, an SAS uh, stock assessment study on the Atlantic surgeon, Sturgeon was uh, made based on one peer-reviewed paper and bad management decisions uh, came out of that uh, uh, effort. So we want, want to see that that's uh, avoided here. So we're anxious to have good dialogue here and give, you, give the SAS as much uh, information as they need, meaningful and truthful information, so that you can make good decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen and Dr. Cooper. Um, any board questions? Tom Foden? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Uh, we've complained about AP reports. There didn't seem to be AP reports and more part of one, what one person felt about the industry. This seemed to me to be a little bit that way, and I'd like to Make sure that doesn't happen again. Mike Millard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A question for Kristen on that table two that had the, the biomedical <coughs> numbers involved in it. The row C talks about the number of biomedical only crabs collected. And then row E talks, uh, is labeled number, number of biomedical only crabs bled. So those, the difference between collected and bled ranges from, I don't know, something like 30,000 to 60,000. What, what is the disposition of, of those crabs that were collected but not bled? Would you like me to answer that, please? Well, uh, well let, me, okay. let me ask a clarifying question. Is this in reference to uh, the biomedical crabs that aren't counted, that are double use in some states for, I think, Massachusetts, that they, uh, the biomedical bleeds it and then they turn it over to bait? Uh, well, the, the label on C says that this is not the double use crabs. This is biomedical only crabs, not those counted against state bait quotas. So I can answer that just from um, viewing data annually for, um, for the FMP review. Um, the, the disposition of crabs is uh, reported and you know, generally crabs can be rejected for a variety of reasons such as size or such as injury. And injury you know, can sometimes be specified I, I, you know, from our perspective, from the reporting perspective, what level of injury there is, you know, that occurs. It could be minor injury. It could be more than that. Um, sometimes it, it is included. Sometimes it isn't. It kind of varies from report to report. To report. Um, but generally, those are crabs, as we interpret with um, the reports that we receive, that they are uh, that those crabs are alive, as far as we can tell, and they're rejected for other reasons uh, than mortality because those that are rejected because they're dead are specifically reported to us and those would be included within the observed mortality of biomedical only crabs from collection to release. That would be the fourth row down. Follow up. Thank you Mr. Chair for follow up. Um, yeah so that I guess that's what I'm getting at Mike is uh, there's observed dead and then there's crabs that are called due to injury. And do we know the, the, the ultimate end to those injured crabs? Are they anywhere accounted for in here? That's something that has been discussed by the TC as well as the plan review team. And with, the, with 
our current you know knowledge that we have we don't know um, that would be something that we would have to ask and that may require a specific study um, to actually investigate what would what would happen you know for rejected non bled crabs that I don't know that we have that information available to us currently. I'll just add that that last column is the amount observed uh, in the uh, observed mortality plus the 15 percent. So that's what's, those are the only mortalities that are included in that final column. And Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the gentleman giving the advisory report may have been talking about this, but I couldn't pick it up exactly. But there was a slide that listed Waco um, harvesting from the EEZ and landing in Virginia. And uh, my understanding is that hasn't happened in about five years. Um, and there's no intent to do that in 2018 either. So uh, I'm not sure if that coincides with what the advisory report was talking about sounded like a different uh, company name up there, perhaps. But uh, anyway, Waco has not made its presence in Virginia for about five years. Dr. Cooper. I'm trying to remember the, the slide. I think it, uh, if I'm correct, it listed two companies in Virginia, and Waco is an FDA licensed facility for making LAL reagent. And um, I, there may be a representative there from here, but that's what I can tell you, and I know this to be uh, the case. The other company that's listed there, uh, some of the principals sold their business to uh, Waco more than a decade uh, ago, so maybe that's the source of, of, uh, of the inaccuracy. Uh, does that answer your question? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A question for, question for Kristen and then a, another question for Dr. Cooper, if I may. Uh, first, Kristen, on term of reference six, it says recommend stock status as related to reference points if available. Why that caveat, if available? Well, there was no formal stock status that came out of the last one. We are hopeful that we will have more data this time to have better models and, or to be able to evaluate a larger suite of models, and we hope to get a formal reference point and stock status out of that. So it's keeping it loose. <laughs> but, that's the, but that's the goal as it is with every stock assessment. We hope to make that more than it was last time. Thank you. And if I could, Mr. Chair, could I ask Dr. Cooper a question regarding the AP report? Um, I, first of all, I thought the AP report was very, very well done and very helpful. And I did note, um, and I'm pulling up the page right now, um, I just want to be able to, oops, I missed the page, one, oh, 117, 117. Uh, I'm right there now. Um, there is a fairly strongly worded comment from you, Dr. Cooper, in the report, uh, noting that um, the preference for peer-reviewed literature, and this has to do with the, um, uh, uh, with the biomedical uh, evaluation of, of mortality, I believe, um, that a preference for peer-reviewed literature could be a concern, um, if I understand the comment correctly, in that it would miss the point of actually looking at the actual practices and the actual mortality occurring at the at biomedical facilities. If I understand that correctly, and I'd like you to comment on that, is the follow to that that what might really be needed is an independent third party scientific review of practices actually occurring at the biomedical facilities? And if so, then I'd like to ask through the chair whether that's something that this board could pursue. Thank you. Well, with respect to uh, uh, that comment, and it's my personal opinion, and I believe the opinion of, of other AP members, uh, uh, certainly from the biomedical uh, community and also from, uh, and I've talked with this with Rick Robbins as well, who is uh, from the other uh, industry, 
And we feel that uh, there have been uh, academic groups have worked very <laughs> done very difficult experiments and worked hard uh, to try to look at the mortality issue, but we have great question with their uh, methodology uh, uh, used. Uh, we're stressing the uh, animals far greater than what would have occurred at, uh, at the biomedical uh, facility. Now we have, I know of uh, some of the state marine resource uh, uh, groups that uh, are doing a lot of work, elegant studies, uh, trying to address the uh, mortality uh, issue. So um, I would be amenable to uh, the board uh, uh, looking at an independent uh, uh, group and looking carefully at the methodology of such studies that might be done. You know, unfortunately, the horseshoe crab is not amenable to study in a laboratory environment. Uh, it's a difficult creature to uh, 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 work with and then uh, um, after the bleeding, uh, introduce them into an environment that uh, represents normal foraging and, and, and so forth. Very difficult, and it's a challenging study. And Bob, to your question, I think as we go into these, the stock assessment, they're gonna be looking at that literature, and perhaps next year is gonna be the appropriate time when they've reviewed what literature is out there see if they're good studies or if something more needs to be looked at. And I think that would probably be the best time for the board to task a subcommittee to look at that if, if the rest of the board agrees. All right, Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a similar concern as to what Bob just voiced, so I, w I would support any effort um, along those lines, whether it's soon or, 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 or further down the road, but not too far down the road. Um, my other question um, was um, Dr. Cooper had, in his presentation had mentioned that the industry is protecting the world's biomedical supply, which I think is a very adm admirable goal. But I'm wondering in terms of protecting the world's biomedical supply, what percent of the uh, lysate that's collected along the east coast of the United States is used in the United States and how much is exported to the rest of the world? I'm not a marketing person, but um, I would estimate that the LAL consumed by an LAL, meaning the Atlantic Ocean uh, product, uh, consumed by the U.S is probably about 40% uh, because our FDA really urges and requires the companies to use a lot of redundant uh, testing and they, in my opinion, uh, perhaps consume more reagent than is actually necessary to get the job done. But in terms of answering your question, I would think that 40% uh, of the LEL is U.S. and the rest is uh, 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 Europe and to a great extent uh, uh, Japan and um, and I think perhaps the amount of of uh, the reagent that is produced by the tachypleus might take care of maybe 10 to 20 percent of uh, the world's uh, supply uh, is is that uh, uh, enough information that answers my question thank you any other board members? Any public comment? Oh, sorry, Stuart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a point of clarification on that 15% uh, mortality estimate that's uh, attributed to the biomedical harvest. Uh, I believe that that value is not based on a single study, but actually on a range of studies uh, that the technical committee reviewed, and, and they basically used an average of of the observed mortality in those studies. Um, and then to the point of, uh, the, on the terms of reference, I was wondering, Kristen, do you think it would be possible to also include some kind of evaluation of the sublethal effects of bleeding on, uh, on the horseshoe crab population? Uh, I know there's been some indication in the past that these animals may not spawn in the year that they're bled and such. 
Yeah, I think some of that would be evaluated as part of kind of digging into this literature. Um, we're going to do a call for data maybe next week, and we hope that any data sets out there that have to do with biomedical will be part of things that we get to consider going forward. But if you want to make that an explicit TOR to evaluate sublethal effects, um, that's at the will of the board. I would. <laughs> We'll get to it. <laughs> any other board members? Any public that wants to? Okay. Just please state your name and association. All correct. Hello, everyone. Uh, Benji Swan from Limuli Laboratories. Um, I put some comments together that um, I will read. Um, my comments, uh, some of them will directly answer some of the questions that were raised today and also um, kind of uh, give a different way of thinking about biomedical uh, mortality. Um, all right, here goes. My comments are as follows regarding biomedical mortality. Dead horseshoe crabs are counted at the biomedical facility prior to bleeding and at release, accounting for mortality from collection to release. From this point on, their mortality rate is not known and difficult to ascertain because of their release into the wild. At the onset of the industry, Ann Rudlow's study, 1983, established a 10% greater mortality rate for bled animals than unbled. Her study had a large sample size of 10,000 horseshoe crabs, and their crabs were released into a small enclosed bay, mimicking the biomedical's return to sea policy. More recently, studies have attempted to improve on Rudlow's study and to arrive at mortality rates. However, the resultant mortality rates are most likely higher than the actual value since the bled animals were kept in recirculating tanks for two weeks or longer rather than being released into their natural environment. One study, intending to mimic the time horseshoe crabs are on deck, placed horseshoe crabs that were already captive and studied for two weeks into a barrel the barrel was pl then placed on top of a roof for four hours in the sun, then covered for another four hours in the shade. They were eventually bled and driven around in a hot van and stored again. Still, under these extreme conditions, 16 of the 21 crabs lived, 76% survival. What should be gleaned from these studies is not the resultant rates, but other relevant facts. The most important fact is that horseshoe crabs are hardy animals, able to withstand hours out of the water and wide ranges of temperatures. The studies also collectively show that the mortality rate is variable, depending on a variety of stressors, such as the amount of blood collected, time out of the water, and temperatures endured. Using best management practices, the survival of the collected horseshoe crabs is guaranteed to be high. Nevertheless, the number of crabs that die from bleeding is estimated to be 15% based on these studies, despite bio biomedical companies' protests that horseshoe crabs do not die from bleeding. Other alarmist concerns want to push the mortality rate higher, suggesting there is a large unaccounted numbers of dead animals due to culling at sea and the possible demise of the rejected horseshoe crabs. However, these numbers are accounted and reported and add very little to the overall mortality. Fishing vessels trawl in a manner that minimizes injury and death and the small percentage of horseshoe crabs rejected at the biomedical facility are for minor injuries that would almost be invisible to the untrained eye. Regarding threshold numbers, establishing a threshold number for biomedical mortal crabs under the horseshoe crab fishery management plan in 1998 was misguided. First of all, the word threshold implies a limit. However, it was not the intention to limit the collection of horseshoe crabs for the manufacture of limulus amoebocyte lysate. Secondly, 
How the specific number of 57,500 was calculated remains a mystery, as reporting of biomedical numbers were not, was not required prior to Addendum 3 in 2003. For 13 years, from 2004 to 2016, the average of the reported number of dead horseshoe crabs was 5,086 horseshoe crabs, and the estimated mortal number calculated after release is 58,721, still close to the 57,500. Over the years, the number of biomedical only harvest crabs and in turn mortal crabs increased slightly. The increase can be attributed to management me measures that resulted in fewer bait crabs utilized and more males used to compensate for taking fewer females. My last point is the suggestion to incorporate synthetic lysate into the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission discussions and documents. I find this to be completely out of the realm of the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission's jurisdiction. Managing the horseshoe crab research for bait harvest and finding alternative sources of bait is part of a fisheries biologist manager's expertise. To think about discussing the needs of human health and the testing of pharmaceutical products is beyond the scope of fisheries. To promote a product that is not accepted as an alternative for LAL is irresponsible. To summarize, to continually suggest that mortality due to biomedical use is unaccounted for and substantial is contrary to the facts. The facts are that the mortality of horseshoe crabs associated with manufacturing lysate is a very small number compared to the number of horseshoe crabs used for bait and the total population. Fact two, that biomedical best management practices, especially our return to sea policy, ensure the utmost survival of the horseshoe crabs. And number three, that exceeding the threshold number is of no relevance and should be eliminated. And that would be it. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. And Mike Schmidt has a copy of my letter if anyone would like uh, a copy. Thank you for your comments. Any other comments? Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, we do need to um, accept the terms of reference. Um, if there are any additions to it uh, or any other tasks, this would be the time to add them. Stuart? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I may, I'd like to make a motion to accept the terms of reference. Uh, and add to the terms of reference uh, an evaluation of the sublethal effects of bleeding on horseshoe crabs. All right. Do we have a second? Colleen? Any discussion? Any objection? Seeing none, we will approve the terms of reference by consent and move on to item six, which is setting the 2018 harvest specs. I think that's Kristen. I guess I'll add that to read this into the record. It's moved to a All right, the motion was moved to accept the terms of reference for the 2018 Horseshoe Crab Benchmark Stock Assessment. 
and add a term of reference evaluating the sublethal effects of biomedical bleeding. Motion by Mr. Michael, second by Ms. Giannini, um, and it was approved by consent. Now, on to the next. While we're bringing up the slide, you guys in the back, it's great to sit up here where you can actually read the little bars and see what they mean. <laughs> All right. Uh, now I'm going to walk us through the 2018 harvest specifications for the Delaware Bay. Uh, we set the harvest specifications using the R model. Uh, we go through this each year, and I've just put up the goals of the R model, which is to manage the harvest of horseshoe crabs in the Delaware Bay to maximize that harvest, but also maintain uh, ecosystem integrity for the uh, stopovers uh, for the birds, mainly the red knots. Uh, I'll go through briefly in this presentation where we are with the red knots and the horseshoe crab populations, uh, as well as review the harvest packages and then tell you what the uh, specifications are. So first, as a reminder uh, of some of the thresholds that are in the R model, we have two population thresholds. One is for female horseshoe crab and one's for red knots. So the way the model functions is that there must be 80% uh, carrying capacity of female horseshoe crabs available in the Delaware Bay to get female harvest of horseshoe crabs. So that's 11.2 million female crabs. Or there's a red knot population threshold, which is 81,900 birds. Uh, there's an additional threshold that there must be a two to one spawning beach sex ratio. Uh, we've never come close to not having that, but that is an additional threshold in the model that if that was not um, what was seen on the beaches, that would also limit harvest. So this is just to remind you that if both population estimates are below threshold, we uh, don't have female harvest of horseshoe crabs in the bay. So this is where we are with the red knots right now. Uh, the estimates come from Mark Resite investigations. Uh, the red line is uh, the population threshold. So you can see that for 2016, the estimates were similar to, or 2017, they were, they were similar to 2016. Uh, there were 49,000 approximately birds, which is below the th bird threshold of 81,900. Uh, you can also see that even with the confidence intervals, we haven't come close to the threshold in the last few years. Uh, it's worth noting that the stopover duration was shorter this year. It was nine and a half days, uh, and last year it was 12.3. The estimates of horseshoe crab abundance come from the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey, but as you may recall, that doesn't run every year. So in lieu of the survey for the years that we don't have it, uh, the committee developed a composite index, which is made up of a few surveys in that region. You can see how well they're tracking each other there. The Virginia Tech trawl survey is in the black line, so it did run this year, so our population estimate is from that. Additionally, that supplied an extra data point for kind of comparing the uh, performance of the composite index. Uh, the 2016 estimate of female horseshoe crabs is 7.7 .7 million females, uh, which is also under the threshold of 11.2 female horseshoe crabs. These are the five harvest packages from the arm, and they range from a full moratorium at harvest package one to a mid-range male-only harvest at two, uh, 500,000 male-only harvest in package three, uh, four has, is kind of the mid-range female male harvest, and then five would be uh, the highest male and female harvest that we have. And the model looks through all possible states of the population, the juvenile abundance of horseshoe crabs, birds, males, females, and it builds a giant matrix of all possible combinations and then applies the harvest packages to that, and that's how we get our harvest. So this is just a summary of where we are. The horseshoe crabs, that's 7.7 .7 million females estimated in the bay. Uh, the red knot abundance was 49,000, and therefore the harvest package is again harvest package three, which it has been for the last several years. So with that, I will take questions. Any questions from the board? All right. Mike. All right, at this point, we will need a motion to approve these specifications. 
All right, Stuart Michaels. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second by Mike Millard. Any discussion? Do we have any opposition? All right, well, this motion uh, is approved by consent also. So this is a motion to uh, select garbage or I guess we need to accept the no, okay, yeah. A motion to select the harvest package three for the 2018 horseshoe crab harvest in Delaware Bay. Motion by Mr. Michaels, uh, second by Mr. Millard, and approval by consent. Um, guys, I'm not going to say anything, but we'll move on to the next uh, area of business right now. And this is uh, reviewing the results of the R model run, incorporating the biomedical data. Um, is that you? First, Kristen. All right. Okay, while she gets that up, I'll just uh, remind you that last year oh, that uh, we went, I think it might have been 2016, we went under a short term review of the R model where we were tasked with evaluating uh, some different parts of it. It was not the full long term review, which would have been more thorough, but one of the tasks we had last year was to. Uh, look at incorporating biomedical data into the R model, uh, particularly since we're talking about doing that for the benchmark, we felt it was appropriate to see if we could also put in the R model so that all of the output is similar. Um, we put forth a preferred option for including biomedical as well as a minority opinion. I will briefly review both of those and uh, the board had tasked us with seeing how that would affect the um, harvest package selection uh, in the model performance. So that's what I'm going to go through today. The preferred option for including biomedical uh, is here. And so what we have on uh, the left side are the current harvest packages that we just reviewed. And then to the right would be how we would deal with biomedical going forward if we included the biomedical data in our model in the, under the preferred option. These are not real numbers, so bio, uh, biomedical data has, the confidentiality has not been breached by doing this. It was kind of, taken from a fraction of what we're attributing to the coast wide and applying a sex ratio to it. Uh, if these were real numbers, what we would do would be taking a running average, so a three to five year average of what's harvested in the Delaware Bay, and we would update that number every few years. So you couldn't really do the math to put an exact number on what that harvest is. Uh, Biomedical is fairly stable for their harvest, so having an average that's only updated every so often is not so much a concern. We'd still capture any major changes, uh, but it would not have to be done every year. And that harvest would be subtracted from the current harvest packages. Um, biomedical, this is not a quota. This is just explicitly showing that harvest is happening in the Delaware Bay uh, from the biomedical industry and by working that into the harvest packages. So you can see that uh, for example, Harvest Package 3, which is the 500,000 male only crabs for the bait fishery, would then be adjusted to subtract the biomedical from it. So that's how that would um, operate. Again, our current harvest packages, one through five. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about how often each is selected under the current R model. And you can see that harvest package one, three, and five are selected much more often than two and four. And this is under all scenarios. So yes, we always get harvest package three, uh, but that's because of the population thresholds. But if we were over those thresholds, you can see that the model actually chooses harvest package five more than the rest of them. And it rarely chooses package two and four. Um, so that, that will be relevant here in a moment. So under this preferred option, when the R model was rerun. Harvest package one was selected 99% of the time under the preferred option that it was under our current R model. So rarely did putting the biomedical data in actually choose the, the model chose a different harvest package. So that was fairly consistent. When it did, instead of a moratorium, less than 1% it went to that male only harvest and less than 1% it went to the highest female male harvest. So that's how this table works. So you can see that harvest package two and three didn't change at all by putting the biomedical data in. If the model under the current 
our model selected Harvest Package 3, it's still selected Harvest Package 3 uh, by including biomedical data in those harvest packages. Harvest Package 4 changed the most. 85% of the time it still had Harvest Package 4, but the other 15 it did go to the full moratorium. Uh, but again, that's where these frequencies come into. Harvest Package 4 is chosen about 1% of the time given all possible uh, states of the populations. So while that is the biggest change, it also is the package that gets selected very rarely. We also put forth a minority opinion uh, for dealing with biomedical data in the R model. Uh, this put the 15% mortality attributed to biomedical in the population dynamics model. Um, so briefly, this is a simple version of how the uh, population dynamics model works in the R model, uh, where juvenile horseshoe crabs uh, can stay as juvenile horseshoe crabs from year to year. They can also go on to be pre-breeders, or they can skip that stage and go right to being adults, and then additionally some die. Uh, same with pre-breeders, and then we get to the adult stage. Some stay in the adult stage, some get harvested at bait, and some die as well. Uh, the way the minority option would work is by including the 15% in that kind of red state as I have in the graph, so putting it right into the population dynamics model. And so this is the table you just saw. The green all the way to the right is how it would change under the minority opinion. So you can see it's a little different from the uh, preferred option. Uh, in general, still pretty similar results. Harvest package one, three, and five were uh, very similar. Uh, by including biomedical in the population dynamics model, those three packages very rarely change to a different package by including biomedical. Harvest package two now was never selected. Uh, when it was selected, it most likely went to one, uh, but it also sometimes went to three. And then harvest package four also was 88% uh, of the time was still selected as harvest package four, but 12% uh, of the time it went to that full male and female harvest. So there was some change, but in general, that's fairly similar results to what we have already by including biomedical either way. Just in summary, there was little change to the harvest packages by including biomedical under both the preferred and the minority opinion. Uh, the preferred option uh, was the preferred option because the ARM committee felt that uh, there was more transparency to it. You see what the biomedical harvest is uh, with those harvest packages. There were some concerns that this baits or that this uh, puts biomedical and uh, bait harvest against each other, that the bait fishermen now see that the biomedical is taking away from their uh, quota for the year. Um, but it's also worth noting that they don't often reach that quota and New Jersey doesn't harvest their portion of it. So there is a bit of a buffer there that uh, it might not affect it as much, but that it's still potentially baiting those two against each other. Um, the minority opinion, uh, oh, I should also mention that if we go with the preferred option of including biomedical, that would uh, require an addendum because the bait, the harvest packages are in, uh, in the addendum, so we would require an addendum to change them to have the biomedical harvest there. Uh, the minority opinion was favored by some because it doesn't require an addendum and it still maintains the same harvest packages. It's just putting that biomedical in the population dynamics model, but it is less transparent because it's kind of hidden in the inner workings of the R model rather than explicitly out there in the harvest packages. Uh, these were presented to the various TCs that uh, fall under the horseshoe crab, and they did maintain that the preferred option is recommended uh, and because of the benefits I just went through. Uh, neither one of them is more accurate. They're just two different ways of dealing with it. Uh, so both the subcommittee and the TCs recommended that going forward. Cooper, do you want to do the AP um, response? Mike. Okay. Uh, the advisory panel reviewed these results as well. Um, the advisory panel looked at them and uh, and they they agreed with um, the TCs and subcommittee on the fact that there's very little change in the harvest packages due to incorporation of biomedical mortality. Uh, so the advisory panel would recommend that, uh, that this mortality not be included in the annual runs of the ARM model. Um, if the board 
does have a preference for, uh, for incorporating biomedical mortality into the arm. Um, the advisory panel has, has recommended the minority option uh, uh, be the preferred option, citing the benefits of protecting the confidentiality. Um, since the mortality would be worked within the population dynamics model itself, it would not be exposed to the public. Um, the, uh, we wouldn't be able to see that overt subtraction from the harvest packages. And in addition, it would not uh, lower the quotas. It would not impact um, the harvest packages themselves. Great. Thank you all. Any questions from the board? Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess this is a question for Kristen. Is there a table? or someplace I can look to see uh, what the effects of the different packages on the bait fishery are re related to the minority report or the minority opinion. You know, you showed the one, the one table that had the preferred option alternative with what um, is being taken, taken out of the bait fishery for the purposes of being accounted for by the biomedical um, industry. However, under the minority opinion, does it change the, does the package change the same way? And the reason I ask is because I think it's very difficult when you look at what's being referred to as a non-quota for the biomedical industry, but then you're taking it away from established quota in the bait fishery. I certainly have concerns about, you know, putting the two forces together. Um, and I would just like to know what those packages look like under the minority opinion. Thank you. That was also a, a recognized concern among our talks, and that's why we went ahead and put forth the minority opinion. Those uh, harvest packages are unchanged in the minority opinion. So the crabs that die through biomedical are just put into the population dynamics model. So instead of subtracting what's harvested each year from when we do the R model, we put in what was harvest. So those were crabs that died, as well as their uh, survival rate goes in there as well, just in general, outside of bait harvest. So this would just add that 15% mortality. So when we subtract what died that year, whether through bait harvest or natural mortality, it would just add an additional amount for uh, the biomedical harvest from the running average of their actual numbers. So the harvest packages would be unchanged. They would be as they are, and that's why it doesn't require an addendum. Follow up. So under package three, there'd still be a 500,000 crab allowance for the bait industry under the, under the minority opinion? Correct. OK, thank you. Any other board, Mike? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two, two comments. Um, the first, I'd, I'd like to get out that I, I do support adding biomedical mortality into the ARM, and I, I don't know if you're uh, ready to take a motion on that a little later in this discussion, but um, I'd be willing to do that. Um, more importantly, back to the, uh, the uh, sensitivity analysis of the preferred option, I appreciate that, that, that was helpful. It seems to me, though, that another uh, sensitivity we could look at is because I, my understanding is that used 15 percent. For many meetings now, we've we've discussed and argued about the 15 percent. I'm I'm wondering if we could task the TC to do a sensitivity analysis on on that 15 percent figure, run a range through there from 5 percent to 10 percent to, and see if that makes a difference. And maybe we can put this whole. Uh, you know, argument about what that exact percentage is to bed if it doesn't really matter in our management uh, scheme. Thank you. So the R model, the 15% that's used follows the benchmark. So part of this process of us reevaluating that number, if we come up with a different number for the Delaware Bay, that will translate over to the R model. So if it turns out that the Delaware Bay mortality uh, is 8% in the new benchmark, that will then be the mortality used in the R model. So I, I do understand your point. If we decreased it to f 5% even for these sensitivity runs, I suspect that the harvest packages still wouldn't change that much because by using the 15%, they barely changed anyway. But that can certainly still be uh, our model uh, subcommittee task. Follow up. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so do I interpret that to say that we, we really don't need to be arguing about what that exact percentage is in our management scheme? I think we're looking forward to reevaluating it because it is a number that comes up and it is contentious. And uh, I think we should be concerned about it. And it's an important number. And we, you know, we look forward to relooking at the data to see maybe if there's a more appropriate number for that. All right. Thank you, Chris. I had the same question as Mike, um, whether or not they did a hypothetical run at five percent or thirty percent. Because if it does go up, we might as well get that out, out in the open right now. Thank you. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a concern similar to, to Mike Luisi's concern, and, and I'm not sure that I've got it straightened out in my mind yet. So if I understand it properly, if the biomedical harvest is included in the ARM model run, there really isn't any difference in, in which harvest package gets selected. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. That's the first part. Um, but the other part is that if the preferred option is chosen, then we'll be in a situation where a quota managed bait fishery, their quota, will be reduced by a non quota restricted harvest. Is that correct? That's also correct. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the the quota for, ba say, a harvest package three, which is always selected, the 500,000, would then be reduced to. 464. So yes, it is reduced, but the biomedical is still a very small portion of the mortality that's being attributed to the Delaware Bay crabs. But we've done these two options in case that that changes in the future, that we now have a, a method of dealing with that. Did you have follow-up? Um, yeah, John just asked something, so I'll, I'll ask that as my follow-up, and, and I believe the answer is no, but let's just verify that. So um, has a quota been reached in the past several years, um, and if not, how close has the bait quota come, how, how close has the bait catch come to that quota, and then thirdly, do we anticipate that that bait catch may go up or down in the future? So the... Within the Delaware Bay, the quota has not been reached in recent years, and I looked at, um, you know, in the hypothetical of the preferred option with those uh, reduced harvest packages, if that level has even been exceeded. And the, even with the lowering uh, that resulted um, from these alternative runs, that level has not been exceeded in the last, uh, well, since, since the arm has been instituted. So, yes. Stuart. But correct me if I'm wrong, is, is, that, is that because New Jersey simply chooses not to harvest their portion of the Delaware Bay? Yes, that is certainly a contributing factor. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to just, to that point uh, raised by Emerson, um, a number, a few years ago when female crab harvest was prohibited um, and we went to male only, it took the industry a little time to rebuild that, that um, market that they had. And over the last few years, specifically to Maryland, we have been, you know, act, being able to access more and more of our, of our male only allocation and the market's there. So, you know, we foresee the issue of reducing our bait crab allowance based on the biomedical industry subtraction as problematic to our continued efforts to um, keep that bait industry thriving at the point where it is. Thanks. All right. Any other discussion? Mike, did you have a motion you wanted to make or is not at this point? Uh, Yes, uh, I'll, I'll throw it out. Uh, I move that the ARM model incorporate biomedical mortality in the preferred option methodology. Do we have a second? 
All right, Chris Wright. Discussion? Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So for clarification, if, if the board approves that the ARM model incorporate the, and I'll wait till the motion is up there, incorporate the biomedical harvest, does that necessarily mean then that part of that process will be that the bait fishery quota will be reduced by the biomedical harvest, or, or is that going to be a separate motion? So using, um, with the wording of this current motion, using the preferred option, then yes, that would be, that would mean that the, the bait quota would be reduced um, by the level that uh, the biomedical mortality is evaluated at. And um, additionally, I believe we would need to make this uh, uh, move for an addendum. Is that correct, Tony? Mike, that is correct. In order to change the parameters or the impacts of the ARM model, we would need to initiate an addendum um, to do so. And I know Mike is talking to Sherry, so I'm not sure. We would need to in initiate an addendum to change the parameters, so it would be an option in the addendum if we were to move forward with this. John? So to be clear, we can't account for the biomedical harvest in the ARM model, but set harvest specifications only for the bait fishery, is that correct? So using, using the preferred option, um, that would require an addendum and that would have the, the reduction in the harvest package. And, and that's the reason why it would require the addendum is because we're changing the actual harvest packages. If uh, we went with the minority option, then there would be no change to the harvest package. And that's why that would not require the addendum. Mike Luisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarification purposes, we've already established the 2018 specifications, right? So this would be an addendum that would be worked on for 2019 and beyond. That's correct. And also, I, I believe we've discussed this last year, and the will of the board was to wait till after the 2018 stock assessment was completed um, to look at this. but we can revisit, you know, initiation of an addendum or initiating an addendum um, if that's the board's will. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while I have no problem supporting uh, the utilization of the biomedical harvest in running the ARM model, I can't support this motion in that it will end up reducing the quota of a quota managed fishery by the amount that's harvested by a non quota managed fishery or harvest so i can't i can't support this motion as it is tony just to make sure we have the right words up there is the maker of the motion and the seconder of the motion okay if we say move to initiate in an addendum that Yes. Okay. Any further discussion on this? The motion, uh, Russ? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm really struggling to figure out why we need to do an addendum right now when we're trying to, you know, we have a stock assessment coming up, and I know how this board works with other species. We're going to say, as this addendum moves on, we're going to say, well, why don't we wait for the results of the stock assessment? So uh, for that reason, I would be you know, opposed to this uh, motion at this time. Um, but if it got tabled from when we were actually going to maybe do a, an addendum or an amendment, I think that makes more sense. Thank you. Well, are you making a motion to table this to a time specific? 
No, I just put, put that out there for discussion, and if, if someone thinks that's the right thing to do, we could do it, or we just vote it down now. That's fine with me. Thanks. Thank you. Eric? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not struggling at all. This is not the time to, to pass this motion at all. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion on this? Does anyone need to caucus? All right. Take two minutes to caucus and... All right, are we ready to, to vote on the motion? Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question that might help us here um, in terms of our discussion with, uh, amongst the uh, uh, New York caucus as well as speaking to our neighbors in New Jersey. If we initiate an addendum, is, is the harvest quota linked to including the biomedical catch in the R model? Or can the addendum process separate that out so that we can incorporate the biomedical harvest in the R model without having the bait fishery quota reduced by the biomedical harvest? not using the preferred motion that would not accomplish that um I, I think what you're getting at emerson are you suggesting the potential of incorporating the biomedical harvest in addition to the current bait quotas is that what you're asking about whether that's a possibility i'm not sure of your question but what i'm suggesting is that we incorporate the biomedical harvest when, when we run the arm model but that we do not reduce the bait quota, the resulting bait quota, by the amount of the anticipated um, biomedical harvest. That would be the uh, minority option. That would be the minority option where the uh, biomedical mortality is incorporated into the population dynamics model itself, but the harvest packages, the quotas themselves, do not change. Right, I, I understand that. So voting in favor of the motion then essentially moves forward the preferred alternative and will not consider the minority opinion. Correct. Thank you. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One further clarification that came up in, in our caucus. Um, would we need to take action on the minority opinion? Or does, if, if this motion were to be opposed, if, if it didn't carry, does the minority opinion then move forward? Or do we have to take up some form of an action by the board today on either the preferred or the minority opinion? Um, at this point, we do not need to make uh, any action going forward. This is, was brought out um, as a follow-up. The um, that they were tasked to look at the biomedical harvest with the ARM model. They came up with the two options. At this point, it was for information if the um, board wanted to look at either option um, in beginning an amendment. That was at this point. Or we could take this as information. We'll get the stock assessment. And next year, we may revisit this same issue and look at the minority, the preferred, or possibly a different option as we get more information. So there is no further requirement um, if this does not pass. So that being said, all in favor of the motion, could they raise their hands, please? Opposed, same sign. Okay, thank you. Uh, abstentions? 
Null votes. All right, the motion fails two to 13. Any other um, board action on this? Bob? I'll give this a shot. I'd like to uh, move to incorporate the biomedical harvest using the minority uh, option. Okay, so you would move to initiate an addendum? No, no, no that's not my intent. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, do we have a second? Emerson. All right, discussion, Bob? It's all been said. I, I feel that it, the first part makes sense to me. The second part, that would be the uh, uh, preferred option. The addendum approach does not make sense to me. I'd rather wait the outcome of the uh, assessment. So uh, to me, it makes sense to incorporate, but going with the uh, minority approach. Thank you. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So procedurally, we've set the specifications for 2018. You know, I think our opposition to the previous motion was in line with New Jersey's concerns. So while I support incorporation of, you know, biomedical mortality into the ARM model and, you know, this type of approach, I, I kind of feel like this would still be getting the cart before the horse a little bit and that we've set the 2018 specifications. The stock assessment process is beginning in January. According to the timeline that I've read in the briefing materials, we're gonna be presented with the stock assessment at the annual meeting next year, which is also the same time at which we would be setting specifications for the following year. So Bob, I guess the way I see it is that We've already set the specs for 2018, so there's not, there's not, um, if we were to use a minority option to incorporate biomedical mortality in the ARM model, we would be doing that for the 2019 specs, yet presumably we would be setting those specs once we had received the information or the output from the stock assessment at this time next year. Does that make sense or am I confusing people? That makes sense. Tom? I agree with everything you said, so it makes sense to me. Rob? So I think you were asked this question. You answered about taking no action, and so what Michelle's indicating does make sense, and I think um, at least a number of us, the way we voted on the last motion, probably understand the implications, so thank you. Okay. Bob? I've been swayed by the discussion. I plan to vote against my own motion. Thank you. Would you like to withdraw? Whatever you prefer, Mr. Chair. I, I'd be happy to withdraw or just call the question, whichever you prefer. Emerson, would you be all right with withdrawing? I'll be fine with that. Okay. Mike? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm even in light of, of the withdrawn motion, I, I, I have a question I think that'll help me, and, and maybe it's for you, Kristen. Um, we, we, we often say, let's wait for the upcoming stock assessment to, to, before we take any action, and I, and I get that when we have the normal biological reference points. And may, I should probably know the answer to this, but it's not occurring to me right now. What is it that will come out of a, this stock assessment that will change the ARM model uh, routine the percentage that we're attributing to biomedical for their mortality could potentially change other than that the R model is not part of the stock assessment so the only thing we're tasked with with the two of them as they relate to each other is comparing any model output from the Delaware Bay region with what comes out of the R model the only number that will transfer over is a percent if if that changes from 15%, if it's reduced or increased, that would then be changed also in the ARM model. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I think so. So, so the ARM model is, is insensitive for the most part, that the packages that it's going to pick are insensitive to the, any stock assessment results. Yeah, they're not really related to, I mean, they are related to each other in that they're using data, but the, nothing from the benchmark gets fed into the R model except for that percent mortality, if we even incorporate biomedical into the R model. Okay. 
All right. Is the board comfortable where we are with this? Good. Seeing lots of nodding heads, we'll move on to the uh, 2017 FMP and state compliance reports. So uh, we received uh, state compliance reports um, to perform the 2017 fishery management plan review. Uh, the plan review team um, conducted that review. Just as a brief reminder of the management history, the FMP was, appro was approved in 1998. Uh, there have been seven addenda, the most recent one being the institution of the ARM framework. Uh, you've already seen this graph, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but as you can see, um, just going from 2015 to 2016, there was an increase uh, in the bait harvest and a uh, decline in the biomedical collection, uh, as well as uh, a decline in the estimated biomedical mortality. The, uh, in 2016, the total coastwide harvest was 787,223 crabs, with the majority of this coming from New York, Delaware, and Maryland. Um, 35, this was a 35% increase from 2015, and there were uh, state-specific increases in landings in Rhode Island, New York, Delaware through North Carolina, and Florida. Um, approximately 65% of the coastwide quota of uh, of 1.59 million pounds was landed. Uh, biomedical facilities collected 426,195 crabs. This was a 21% decrease from the previous five-year average. Um, there were temporary changes in production in 2016 that, uh, that resulted in a lower number than has been seen over the past few years. Uh, the biomedical only mortality estimate, so these, again, um, uh, the estimated mortality of crabs that were not uh, then incorporated into the, the bait industry, um, that estimate was 48,780 crabs using the 15% uh, number, and that, uh, with the uncertainty of uh, multiple studies that are used in formulating that number, um, we present a range from 5% to 30% mortality, and you can see the associated numbers there. Um, there is a, uh, a text edit um, that I, I noticed as I was making the presentation, but it's not uh, in the actual text of the FMP review. Um, we, we did a little, bit, um, a little bit of consideration of what uh, that 15% was actually incorporating, and the uh, the last two sentences of page six, and this is in the graph, but not in the text, um, but those where it says up to the point of release should be up to the point of bleeding. The 15% is meant to incorporate uh, mortality associated from the, state, from the process of bleeding um, on forward to release. Uh, so just that's a point of clarification there. Uh, de minimis, uh, states may apply for de minimis if their combined average uh, bait landings for the last two years are less than 1% of the coastwide bait landings for the same two-year period. Um, measures in these states, uh, they, they're not required to implement any harvest restriction measures, but they are required to implement the monitoring requirements um, from A, B, E, and F of the FMP. Um, the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida all requested and qualify for de minimis for 2017. New Jersey qualified since they do not have a bait harvest, but they did not request de minimis status. Uh, the plan review team um, has uh, a few uh, recommendations and, and statements regarding the, uh, this year's review uh, of the FMP and compliance. Um, there is a concern with uh, the number of crabs that are un unidentified by sex um, within the uh, biomedical reports. Um, there was a reporting format that was worked on collectively um, among the Horseshoe Crab Technical Committee, since many of, uh, many of those members are the ones that provide the data. Um, we, we work to develop that so that it's a bit clearer when, uh, when those reports are submitted to, uh, to the plan review team so that um, we can be able to uh, identify what is in those reports a bit, uh, a bit more clearly. 
um, and this, this new format will be included in the compliance report template for 2018. Um, this is not asking for any new information, it's just a clarification for uh, a clarification of format. Um, the plan review team recommends continued, uh, continued funding for the Virginia Tech trial survey. Um, this survey was funded in 2018, and we are in the process of attaining funding. Oh, excuse me, it was funded for 2017. We are in the process of attaining funding uh, for 2018, but that has uh, not been finalized. So we hope to get, um, we hope to hear good news on that uh, sometime soon. Um, other than that, the plan review team uh, found all states um, to be consistent with the FMP with the exception of the District of Columbia who did not submit a report and has not done so for uh, the last 15 or more years. So the PRT would recommend to the board that all states be found in compliance uh, with the requirements of the FMP with the exception of the District of Columbia and that the board approve de minimis status for the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And with that, I will take any questions. Mr. Boyles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike, I, I seem to remember discussions about D.C. in years past. Is this something we can make a recommendation to the policy board to excuse the District of Columbia from its obligations and its membership on the Horse and Crab Board? As far as I understand, that that uh, is something that has been talked about at previous meetings and the hurdle that is in the way is that District of Columbia is not present at these meetings and um, as far as I know we cannot excuse them without their presence or the board could not excuse me great question Tony sorry about that um, we'll just follow up with um, with Brian and see if you want to be removed from the board, if he wants to be removed from the board, then we can take him off the declared interest. And the next time we approve that, the policy board can, then they'll be removed. Mr. Boyles. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A question maybe for our New Jersey delegation. I know they did not request de minimis. I, I would ask, is there interest um, in that? And if so, I'd make the motion if you're ready, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Boyles. Mr. Chairman, I would um, make the, oh, my cheat sheet's gone. I'd make the motion that we accept the uh, 2017 FMP review and, uh, and approve the de minimis requests uh, of South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and PRFC. Do we have a second? Mr. O'Reilly, any discussion, any objection? All right. The motion was to accept the Horseshoe Crab 2017 FMP review and state compliance reports and approve de, de minimis requests for Potomac Rivers Fishery Commission, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Motion by Mr. Boyle, second by Mr. O'Reilly, and the motion passed by consent. All right, on to the next. I believe this is Tina is going to speak to us about um, getting some non-traditional stakeholders uh, on the AP. Hi there. Uh, recently we sent out a notice of a uh, call for nominations for non-traditional stakeholders to the Horseshoe Crab AP based on uh, the board's fairly recent discussion about adding some shorebird interest to that AP. We received a number of nominations and would be our request to the board that we get a couple of uh, volunteers from the board to uh, sit in with staff and uh, review those nominations and make recommendations to the board at its next meeting for uh, the addition of candidates to the AP. Thank you. So basically, if I'm getting this correct. It's going to be creating a subcommittee from this board looking at um, adding two non-traditional, probably at least one from the shorebird um, group, if not both. Um, and if it's the will of the board, we'll get together a handful of commissioners to populate uh, that group and go over the nominees. 
Is there any objection to that plan? All right, seeing none, is that okay with y'all? Yes, but I would be um, selfish and ask for um, a couple of people, two or three people to step up, maybe in addition to you, Malcolm, just to meet via conference call so we can, we can do that sooner than later. All right. All right, Tony. Oh, I just was saying we could show hands. All right. Anyone who'd be interested in reviewing those members? All right. Stuart? Pat? Bob? All right. Thank you all very much. Um, we're at the penultimate part of this. We need to elect a vice chairman for the board. Do we have any nominations? Yes. I'd like to nominate John Menescalco as the vice chair. Second. Second by Dr. Duvall. Any discussion? Any objections? All right, congratulations. <laughs> and with that, we've been. Is there any other business to be brought before the board? Dr. Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just really quickly, um, when just prior to the board meeting, this is something I let uh, staff know about, but. Um, I just wanted to make note of it here is that during some dealer checks that we had, it was brought forward that one of our dealers um, found a couple of tickets from 2014 that resulted in 3,371 unreported horseshoe crabs from 2014. So I passed this along to staff to let them know um, you know, the statute of limitations in North Carolina is two years for a misdemeanor, so we're unable to take any action on this. But after talking to Mike and talking to Tony, um, it seems like that, that amount, you know, did not put us over any, um, well, it exceeded North Carolina's horseshoe crab quota. It did not put us over any um, quota limits from a coastwide perspective, but you know, perhaps Tony or Mike want to speak to that. I'm just bringing this up in the interest of full disclosure. Thank you. So what we, uh, what we discussed related to that was the possibility of a retrospective uh, quota transfer. There have been quota transfers in the past from uh, specifically from Georgia to North Carolina. And um, we looked into that option, but with the timing of it being in 2014, as well as the fact that within that year, uh, the additional unreported crabs would not have uh, exceeded the regional quota. Um, for, so for that South Atlantic population, uh, there does not need, we do not uh, need to have that, uh, that quota transfer, that retrospective quota transfer, and we can just move forward from here and update the numbers that are, uh, that are within, within the landing's history. All right, any other business? Seeing none, I want to thank everyone for being efficient for the discussions at this meeting. Uh, for our chairs who uh, condensed a lot of information and have us all waiting for the stock assessment next year. Um, Bob. All right, given the time we're leaving a little earlier, um, we can all adjourn for lunch and Coastal Sharks will convene at one o'clock, not at 1.15. So everyone enjoy lunch. <laughs>